If you'll open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, that's where we are right now in our Sunday study. We also have Bible study. It's called Lunch and Learn on Tuesday. If you're free from lunch, come on in about 11.30 or so and grab you a bite of lunch. I will be in at 12 to teach you for an hour. A special study on Tuesday, Lunch and Learn, here at the church. You don't have to bring a thing, just bring your body in and get a free lunch uh, and study the Bible with me. Well, when you look at Genesis, the second chapter, 15 through 17, is where we are. We have worked our way into the second chapter. Here's what it says. Then the Lord God took the man, the man that's in verse 7. Let's look at 7 and 8. The Lord formed man out of the dust from the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. Actually, in the Hebrew, it's plural. It should be lives. It's nishama hayim. And when a Hebrew word ends in I am, it's plural. And in Hebrew, that's nishama hayim. He breathed in a nostril breath of life, lives, and man became a living being or soul. The Lord planted a garden towards the east in a place called the Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Now we pick that man back up in verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, or eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. There is so much more in the Hebrew language than how it's identified in the English. The word freely eat and surely die are really interesting in the Hebrew language, and it carries a lot of theology. When I get there today, I'll explain that to you in some detail. So we're in the antediluvian period of human history. The antediluvian period of human history picks up man in Ge Genesis 2-4 and on, Genesis 2-4, and it carries him to Noah's flood. That's the antediluvian, means before the flood. Antediluvian means before the flood. And so we have the human history that's not recorded anywhere except in the Bible. When you try to, to, try to identify the antediluvian world from post-diluvian, the period we live in, the post-diluvian period, and try to figure it out, it is enormously difficult because Noah flood, Noah's flood covered the earth and changed the geography of it. And so when you're looking at geography in there, it's an enormous difficult subject. You really have to look for key markers in the antediluvian period, like where the ark rested on Mount Eret and the two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. The only two, these are the only words we have out of the anti-living world that we have markers for in geography. Well, it's a wonderful period of human history that nobody knows about, and that's the reason I'm teaching about it. It is in, in the... Moses, when he wrote this book, he, Moses wrote five books. When he wrote Genesis, he wrote it really interesting in the Hebrew. He, made, he wrote it in two manuscripts. He wrote it in two manuscripts. The first manuscript was Genesis 1-1 through the second chapter, verse 3, which we have studied in great detail. And if you would like to study it, then go back, go to our website, pick it up, and study it. The second manuscript is from the second chapter, verse 4, to the end of the book. That would be chapter 50, 26. 50, verse 26. 
in the second manuscript, he wrote it in 11 Toledos in Hebrew. He wrote it in 11 sections. The first Toledot, I'm studying right now with you. We've looked at the first manuscript and study it in great detail. We're now looking at the first of 11 Toledos, which is the chapter 2, verse 4, to the end of the fourth chapter, verse 26. That's the first Toledo. Now, you say, well, my Bible don't do that. <laughs> I know. The English Bible is written by chapters and verses. That was late in history when that was done. The Bible was never written that way originally. The, the English got a hold of the Bible and we did something that was really important for, the, for, for a translation for English, uh, for Gentiles, and for English. Well, so I'm in the first Toledoth, okay? I'm in the first Toledoth. And we are, we are engaged in the antediluvian period, which that involves. And I'm discussing the Garden of Eden period. This is a wonderful period of human history. This is the period of Adam and Eve. You have the first man, Adam, the first woman, Eve, the first marriage, and the first family, all in this section, the first Toledoth. The first people of human history. They had two sons, Cain and Abel. Now, you're probably very familiar with the story behind it. Many, listen, there are many theologians, Christian theologians, that think that's myth. Don't think they ever existed. They think this is like mythology. Nothing could be farther from the truth. For example, in 1 Corinthians 15.45, It says there's a first Adam and a last Adam. It says that the first Adam is the one we're talking about. The first Adam is the first man of the human race. And he became the federal head of the entire human race until the last Adam came in. That last Adam, Adam that came in is what we celebrate at Christmas. Jesus Christ is the last Adam. Did you already know that? <laughs> well, if you did, you should have wrote it down on your paper. Do you have a paper? There's a pencil there. You should have wrote it down because I'm going to tell you, your, your human existence based on these two people. The first Adam and the last Adam. The first Adam got, us, got the human race in a heap of trouble called sin death, and the last Adam solved it. He hung on a cross for the sin death, was buried and raised from the dead. This period, and it's very important, this period is very important. And the New Testament writers really believe there was a place that existed, and these were real people. Okay? So don't, let it, don't let anybody blow smoke in your face over this issue because the whole New Testament believes that this, these people really existed. There was really a period of human history and out of it came the sin death of the human race. We'll talk about that today. I got four points in the first hour. We're going to come back to the second hour and really dig into this. All right? But I'm going to hold you for a while. Then I'm going to give you coffee and donuts, and I'm going to bring you back, and we're going to finish this study up. Here's point number one on your paper. The Garden of Eden was introduced in Genesis 2, 7, and 8. I just read that to you. Where, where did the man come from? Right? God, 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 listen, just, just the human phenomena. The first man was made from the dust of the earth. And and because of that, because he was from Adamah, 
the ground, they called him Adam. The second person was Eve, and she was created out of Adam's rib. But we didn't call her rib. We called her Eve because she became the mother of all the living. That's why we call her Eve. She was the mother of all living. That's it. She got married. She had kids. She had two. Cain and Abel. And she became, listen, she became the mother, the mother, the prototype of all mothers that bring life into the world. And listen, don't listen to them. Mothers are still the only ones that bring life into this world, even if men claim they can do it. They can't even deal with kidney stones, let alone babies. Well, God created man and placed him in the Garden of Eden. Where was the Garden of Eden? It was in a place called Eden. The Garden was in a place called Eden, the Bible says. <clears throat> now, in verse 7 and 8, I gave you some technical stuff in there about man in the Hebrew and the Greek. I've already studied that, but I put it on the paper for people that might be new some of that's like Cal and Perfect and all that. I've already studied some, I'm going to do it again. But what is important to this is verse 7 and 8. Now listen to me, in the plan of God, Genesis 2, 7 and 8 occurs before Genesis 2, 15 through 17. Do you understand that? You know, what came first? Well, Genesis 2, 7 and 8 came before Genesis 2, 15 through 17. Would you agree with, agree with that? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. That? And, and what, so what's that teach us? What's that teach us? What does it teach us that Genesis 2, 7, and 8 precedes Genesis 2, 15 through 17? Here are two doctrinal points that it teaches you, and you should learn this because nobody else understands this period of history. This is, where, this is the cradle of human civilization. We're talking about the cradle of human civilization right here. Watch it. Here are two doctrinal points. That I'm at point two. There are two doctrinal principles, theological principles, that come from the study of the gap. Here is Genesis 2, 7, and 8, and there is a, a, a period in here until you get to Genesis 2, 15, 16, and 17. There's a, there's a period of time there. There's a period of time. And what does that teach us? What possible, what possible lesson could I get from that today in 2022? Here's the first one. Here's the first one. You ought to really get this now. God has already planned ahead. That's Genesis 7 and 8, 9. God has already call that in You do it in human terms. You call it foreknowledge. You know what foreknowledge is? Foresight. We all love to be able to have foreknowledge. Well, I sure wish I'd have known that before I bought it. <laughs> you ever heard anybody say that? I sure wish I'd have known that's the kind of place it was before I signed up to be part of that. Right? Foreknowledge is tapping in to what God has planned ahead of time for you. And listen, you live in the foreknowledge of God. That's the practical experiences of your life, is foreknowledge. God, listen, here's point number one. Here's my first doctrinal point. God has already planned ahead for all of man's daily needs. You say, well, Ron, how do you know that? Well, Jesus, in his, one, he said, well, the disciples that teach me to pray, he taught him to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Remember that one? 
You know what it says in verse 11? I'm in Matthew 6, 11 with that. You know what he says? Give us this day our daily bread. Bread? Listen, I'm a farm kid. You know, you know how we got bread? We sowed wheat, waited it for grow up, we harvested it, put it in sacks, took it to the mill, they ground it up and gave us flour. We brought the flour home, grandmother mixed it up with a whole bunch of different things, put it in the oven, either ran by coal or wood in that day, and when she pulled it out, it was homemade bread. Can you imagine something like that? It's no different today when you go to the store and buy a loaf of bread. Where do you think that loaf of bread came from? Well, it came from Publix. I mean, where did it really come from? Where, where did it really come from? And how in the world did it ever get into public from a seed planted in, a, in the ground? See, we forgot all that stuff, apparently, even in Moody. So, give us this, give us this day our daily bread. Do you think there had, did, was there foreknowledge to that? Was there, was there foreplanning to that? Somebody had to plant the seed, had to cultivate it, had to harvest it, had to put it in sacks, then take it to the mill. As a kid, the, one of the great excitements of all my life was going with my grandfather to the mill every Saturday for the cows and for grandma. We ground up some for the cows and some for grandma <laughs> so she can make bread and do other things. Where's that? See, that's it's teaching you foreknowledge, and foreknowledge teaches you the grace of God. The grace of God that would plant seeds and harvest them, take them to a mill, and somebody would know how to make a loaf of bread from it. Or take the corn and get cornmeal and do cornbread. All of that was is all of that is foreknowledge. All of that is planning ahead. When he says that all you have to say to God is give us this day our daily bread, look at all the things that God had to do to get the bread to Publix. So that you could go down and get a loaf of bread. What do you think? It just came out of the air? They just magically showed that? No. Listen, all those steps to get you to a loaf of bread is the grace, is logistical grace of God. God has foreplanned all that for your life. I mean, when we wanted a steak, you know how we got it? We raised a cow from a calf butchered it, cut it all up. Now you hunters know what I'm talking about. And then we then we had a steak. You just get a steak. There's foreknowledge in that. There's pre-planning in that. You know who's who's the ultimate source of all that you have in your life to make your life important is God. If God hadn't given us the ground, hadn't given us the seed, we wouldn't have any bread. And there's a whole process that God has instituted to bring you to a place of the prosperity of having bread. The loaf. You just go to the store and buy a loaf. I'm amazed at that. I'm still amazed at that. And I still like I personally still like homemade bread with homemade butter. But we had to milk the cow, churn the milk. <laughs> we just... And what a wonderful lesson it taught me as a farm boy of the marvelous grace of God. We take so much for granted today that should be taken for grace. 
Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for giving me a loaf of bread. When I go to the store and buy a loaf of bread, I am amazed at it. I'm amazed when I go buy anything but a store. that They've got so much stuff. There's a whole lot of farmers out there chunking it out to make that thing as easy as it is. It's an amazing grace, and I'm not sure that we all have a deep appreciation of it. I'm not sure we really understand all that's involved when he says, give us this day our daily bread. It, it's dealing with meeting your needs that's been all pre-planned out. God, God gave us the ground, gave us the seed. Then he raised up farmers to bring it. There's such a process by the time grace gets on your table, God has been heavy, heavily engaged in the work of putting it there so that you can say grace. You do say grace when you eat, don't you? My, my, my. I am so thankful. I go down to Cracker Barrel and get breakfast. Didn't have to do anything but pay for it. That's amazing to me. That's so amazing that I'm so appreciative that God would do all that and that he would have this wonderful change of logistical grace. The people who raised the chickens and brought the eggs and raised the pig and gave me the ham and <laughs> the bacon. It's an amazing... Are you thankful this Thanksgiving? Are you thankful? But listen, you should be thankful. You should be thankful for all that God has prepared in foresight for your life. You know, it's not a long life. You do know that, don't you? It's not a long life. And I'm going to tell you, you need to know that God has planned everything in your life here on earth so that you could understand that he's planned everything for you in heaven. You should have the same appreciate the things that you have here on earth that have been so prepared for you ahead of time, he has done for you in eternity. If you want all of that stuff in eternity, like you can get all this stuff here by grace, then you really need to understand that the key to that whole thing is God has brought it and he brings it to you through his son, Jesus Christ. Do you know that, people? My, my, my. Do you know this stuff? Do you have that? This Of all the Thanksgiving, please have a grateful heart this Thanksgiving. And listen, think, think about the people in your family that are not sitting at that table this year because they're dead. They're dead. Your great-grandparents, your grandparents, your brothers, your sisters, your uncles, your aunts. A lot of people that sat at that table a year ago, two years ago, three years ago are not there anymore. Where are they? Where did they go? They say, well, they went to the cemetery. No, I'm talking about where did their soul go? Because all that God has prepared here on earth has been prepared in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's a person on earth with a heart for God in heaven. And he has got that there for you just like he's got this here for you. And listen, you need to appreciate what he's given you on earth to really have a sense of appreciation when you get to heaven because you're, 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 you're going to be amazed. You talk about amazing grace. You sing it here to live it there. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. So, God has already planted, planned ahead for knowledge. Our doctrinal point for all mankind's daily needs by the doctrine of logistical grace. Like Philippians 4.19. 
my God shall supply all of your needs according to the riches of his grace in Christ. He has planned for it in eternity past at the Eternal Life Conference. That's why it's yours by privilege through Christ and given to you on the basis of grace. Here's a second doctrinal point. In eternity past, God planned for every believer in Christ. He planned both in time and eternity. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles. I wrote it on your paper. I want your eyes to see it. I'll bet you that if you've been to a funeral, you've heard this. This is a popular sermon passage that, that, that men preach, and rightly so, at funerals. I've preached it. Listen to what, watch what John 14, 1 says. Watch this. I'm, I'm, I'm just dealing with verse 1 and 2 just to catch your attention. Listen to what he said. Do not let your hearts be troubled. About what? See, let not your hearts be troubled. Their hearts were troubled about something. Would you agree? Mm, yes. Their heart. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Their hearts were troubled over something. And what was it? It was about death. Their hearts were troubled about death. He said, well, your heart shouldn't be troubled about that one. And this is why. Believe in God. Believe also in Christ. Who's speaking? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is speaking. Do not let your hearts be troubled. What were they troubled about? Dying. Death. They were troubled about death. Well, you, if you read the chapter 13, you would know it. Chapters 13 through 17 deal with Christ going to the cross. Right? And they, the disciples were upset with him talking about dying all the time. The, la the last several weeks prior to his crucifixion or month, he was, that was his focus and teaching his disciples, I'm leaving. I'm, gonna, I'm going back to the Father. And they went, no, 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 no. Quit talking that way. Do not let your hearts be troubled. He said, you believe in God? Then believe also in me. Now watch this. Watch this promise now. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. That's, they were upset because he said, look, I'm dying. I'm going back to the Father. And they go, ah. He said, listen, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. You, can, you think you're going to get We're all going to die. I'm going to die ahead of you. And I'm going to prepare. I'm going to, I'm, listen, Christ has died ahead of all of us. And you can be sure of this. He's gone to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. I call it Hotel Heaven. There are many rooms. There's always enough room. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. I mean, that you can put your name on that door. You are registered in Hotel Heaven. If you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, your name is written in the register book called the Book of Life, and you are registered in Hotel Heaven. And when you die, you check in. When you check out, you check in. When you check out, you check in. Go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself. There you may be also. You say, what a wonderful what are you talking about. He's talking about heaven. And listen, it's a place for knowledge has already planned it. It was planned in eternity past that there would be a heaven and an earth. And that you would have a place on both of them. But if you want a place in heaven, you've got to go through Jesus Christ. John 
John 14, 6. In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. See, I, I read John 14, 1, 2, and 3. And down in verse 6, it says, you can't get to hotel heaven apart from Christ. you got to believe that he is the way. And the way is that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And you see, your, ho your hotel there, but you've got to be registered. How do I get Your name has to be in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your name has to be in the Lamb's Book of Life. The moment you believe, it's, re it's, it's recorded and, and kept. And when you check out from here, you check in there, you're already registered. I have a room prepared for you. I have a place prepared for you. Just like life on earth is You understand that? Well, I hope. I hope that's why I've spent all my time with this. The doctrine of principle, I'll give you a perfect out of my own life. This doctrinal principle of God's foreknowledge of logistical grace taking care of me on earth, take care of me in heaven. Watch this now. I had a recent experience in my own life with this idea of faith. When I came out to Moody, I already had a home, but I wanted to be on the church field. My church field is St. Clair County. I wanted to be in Moody. I wanted to be in Moody. So I started looking around in Moody to find me a place to live. I found it was pretty difficult. <laughs> a place I wanted to live. Not, not a place to live, but a place where I wanted to live. And so I do what I normally do. I ask the Father to lead me to the place that had been prepared for me. Right? Is that a fair... Can, can, I, can I pray that prayer? I mean, can I pray, give me this day my day bread, a loaf of bread? Is that? When I get a loaf of bread, is that complete? I mean, I don't, from a seed to me, yeah, ground. And here's what he did. He gave me a garden, a completed garden home, already done. Everything done. All I had to do is move in. In a garden community. Community already up, all the street lights, paved roads. Dog didn't bark too much. Nobody, nobody chased me or run me, run me around. All that was prepared. Listen, did I expect to find it? Yeah, I did. Just like when you go to Publix, you expect to find a loaf of bread. If not, then you worry about it because there's been a raid on bread. You can begin to worry. Storm coming in or something, right? There's been a raid on bread. Listen, and listen, I expect that because God, God has prepared. God has prepared me for that. That's the way I think. Is it legitimate for me to think that way? Absolutely. I'd be happy with whatever he gave me. But I'm asking for a loaf of bread. I'm asking for a house that's already completed. I look for land to build a house. And he went like, nah, I'm not going to do that. And I went, okay. I live in something that's been pre 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 done. It's all been done for me. All I had to do is move in. Okay? And I was I thought about that. Lost my wife in 2020. And I when I went in there, I thought, oh, I I, I wish Jane could be a part of this experience with me. And I thought, well, wait a minute, she is. She's in a better place than I got. What what, what are you whining about? Well, I would love to have her be part of this move with me. I know. Well, listen, he, she made a bigger move than you made. And I went like, thank you, Lord. Boy, that is so true. Hotel heaven would beat this. No matter what I got here, it would beat that. Beat that. Beat any hotel down here. Later, the Garden, I'm at point three. Later, the Garden of Eden was given a special title called Paradise. That thing is called Paradise. 
Hotel Paradise. It's called paradise. How do you know it? Jesus declared it. Paul declared it. John declared it. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Truly I say to you, today, that's while he was alive, today you will be in paradise. He's going to, listen, he gave him the promise of checking out and checking in. And between those two points, in one day, that man's going to die. In the same day, he's going to paradise because, and he's only going to go there, not because he died. He's only going to go there because he believes that the man who's talking to him is his Savior. That he is not dying for, that man in the middle cross is not dying for his sin. He's dying for mine. And when he checked out, he checked in. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. All right? Paul, to the Corinthian church and all the saints of Archaea, which we know in chapter 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10, and in verse 3 and 4, he said, I, he was talking about himself, I know, watch this now, here's what people miss when they read that. I know how. Look at your paper. I wrote it down there. And I know how. Such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, he didn't know for sure if he died or, or had a near-death experience, you know, unconscious kind of thing. I do not know. I do not know about that. But listen, he said, but I do know how. Watch this now. God knows about whether it was in the body or out of the body. But this I know. I know how. I was caught up into paradise. Up, not down. Up. You know why paradise, when Jesus said to the thief, I'll see you today in paradise, they went down. Luke 16. When Paul had that experience, he went up. You know why? Paradise was no longer in the earth. Paradise, it wasn't on the earth or under the earth. Paradise was in heaven. When Adam and Eve, they were in paradise on the earth. When Jesus said to the thief, I'll see you today, paradise was in the, was in the heart of the earth. Well, you should read Luke 16. I'm, I'm just encouraging you. All right? Jesus says paradise. Paul says paradise, caught up into paradise, and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. The Apostle John. The Apostle John to the churches of Ephesus, to the churches of Ephesus in Revelation, the second chapter, verses 1 through 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, Holy Spirit, says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The tree of life that was in the paradise in the Garden of Eden is now in the paradise of the third heaven. How about that? <laughs> Write this down on your piece of paper. Write this down. Because he, listen, I'm going to tell you why you should write this down. First John 5, 4. Let me tell you why. Because, see the word overcomes? You say to me, what's that mean? Listen, I'm going to read it again because you missed it. He who overcomes, I will grant to eat. I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the garden of God. The tree of life in the garden of God. Now watch. What does this mean? He who overcomes. Well, Ron, what do I have to do to be an overcomer so that I can, I can be there, right? Eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God, which is in heaven. 
1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4 says, Whatever is born of God, it didn't say whoever, it says whatever. In other words, what doctrinal principle? Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. What is it? Our faith. Now write this down. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Depends on what the issue is. What is the doctrinal issue that faith has to attach to for God to bring to pass? See, it depends. You know, if you want to get to heaven, then you got to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ because no man can get there apart from Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. I mean, it's, it's essential. <clears throat> now, let me give you one more point. We're going to get out of here, and I'm going to come back the second hour and pick this up. There were only two commandments. When it says a command, it really means commandments. There were only two commandments given in the Garden of Eden period. Two commandments. Two commandments. These two commandments are known as the Enoch Law, the Law of Eden in the Garden. Both commandments have a Hebrew grammatical principle called the absolute infinitive. When I come back for the second hour, because I'm going to take a break here and come back. I'm going to talk about the E-D-E-N-I-C, the Enoch Law, which had two commandments that affect your life today. And there, there's some technical parts to it in the Hebrew grammar that are really important that you can't say in the English unless you understand. Right? For example, freely eat and surely die. What's that mean? In the Hebrew, I'll explain it when we come back. Well, let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. If you're a guest, why don't don't worry about it. this meal's been paid for. You're our guest. Uh, they'll take the offering. Uh, we're gonna have prayer. They'll take the offering. Then we'll we'll take a 15 minute break. When we come back, I'm going to go into this discussion with you. That's really important to your life. The Enoch commandments. It was called the law. It involved two commandments that affect your life in a great way. Well, let's have prayer. Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way, uh, both by the automobile and the Internet. But, Father, we ask you today, as we give our offering, to be wise stewards of it. Spend a little on ourselves and most on reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for our foreign missionaries in the Philippines, South Africa, different areas of Africa through Rick's ministry, and Ukraine. The Myers are all over Europe right now because of the difficulty uh, they are with the displaced people. And so we, we pray for great ministries for them in a warm, torn country. We lift them before you, Father, and pray for great things to come out of their ministry during this time of warfare. Uh, bless this offering, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.